Well, for those of you who are visiting for the first time, <laughs> you have walked into an unusual church service here at Cornerstone Chapel. Normally on Sundays, and on Wednesdays for that matter, I teach straight through the Bible, and presently on Sundays we're in the Gospel of Matthew. But for today, instead of continuing in the Gospel of Matthew, we will resume that next week. Every four years, uh, just prior to a presidential election, I deliver what I call an election day sermon to present a biblical and an historical perspective on the issues of our day and the candidates themselves, and today is such a day. So let me say a few things before I begin. First, you are free to disagree with me. This is America, after all. You may vehemently disagree with me, but I will defend your right to disagree with me as much as I hope you will defend my right to say it. This is America. Some may choose to leave our church as a result of today's message. I have spoken things and delivered messages far less controversial than what I will be saying today, for which people have angrily left our church, so I have no illusions. There will be some who may in fact decide to leave Cornerstone. This is no longer something you want to call your church home. But know this, if you choose to leave, you do it by your choice, not my preference. The truth is that people from differing political views are welcome here. Just like people with differing uh, doctrinal views are welcome here. But at the same time, I will not compromise my calling or this pulpit to appease you. Amen. And the, the reason is, the reason is because I fear God more than I fear you. Amen. And because I can tell this is going to be the fiery service of the two today. <laughs> and because, quite honestly, I want to please God more than I want to please you. If you do choose to disagree, I would simply respectfully ask that you do it in a way that is neither divisive in the body of Christ nor disruptive to today's service. Okay? Um, we have plenty of people attending here today, and we have many more watching online. And so for those of you who are here today in person, I just want you to understand this is a religious service. And it is against the law, actually, in the Commonwealth of Virginia and most states to disrupt a religious service. So if you somehow feel the compulsion to disrupt today's service, <laughs> I just want you to know, fair warning, we have local law enforcement and state troopers stationed throughout the congregation. We do. We do. And they will help you to find a jail ministry. Okay? We, we love you in Jesus. We do. But this is God's house, and we expect respect and decorum for today's service. The last thing on all this. Paul tells pastors in particular in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, that the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, and those who oppose him, he must gently instruct. I am aware of the platform that God has given me, and sometimes people like to remind me of that when they disagree with me. Don't you know the platform that God has given me? I can't believe you said that. Okay, I understand. Uh, and I take to heart the biblical responsibility that Paul outlines there for pastors, challenging pastors to make sure that we're, we don't quarrel, we're kind to everyone, and we instruct gently. But I am also aware of the righteous indignation that Jesus displayed, the apostles displayed, and the prophets of old displayed over the religious hypocrisy and the moral unrighteousness in their land. And so you may see some of that and hear some of that righteous indignation in me today. If at any time I sound angry, know this, I am not angry with you. 
Factually, I love you, and I love you enough to tell you the truth. But I am angry with the spiritual forces of evil that have hijacked the hearts and minds of people in an effort to try to capture the soul of America. And I am angry with demonic principalities, and by extension, demonic principles that have influenced millennials, Gen Xers, and Gen Zers with godless philosophies and the doctrines of men. I am angry with politicians who are either knowingly or unknowingly pawns of darkness instead of agents of light who are advancing a godless agenda that is destructive to our country. And thus I cannot be silent, I will not be silent, and neither should you. America needs to wake up and it starts with the church of Jesus Christ. We need to wake up, Christian. We need to wake up, Christian. This is a battle. This is a war. This is not a game. It's a spiritual battle that we are facing for the heart and soul of America and for the heart and soul of the next generation. I have never felt as passionate for and concerned about America as I am today. We as the Church of Jesus Christ are God's restraining force in the world today against evil. And if the church of Jesus Christ does not rise up and fight the good fight of the faith, who will? If we abdicate our role and our responsibility as ambassadors for Christ and as agents of truth, then evil will triumph. It was Edmund Burke who said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And so I, I can't remain silent and to do so would be evil. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany who was part of the German resistance that opposed Nazi Germany. Bonhoeffer said this, quote, silence in the face of evil is itself evil, and God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act, end quote. The Nazis executed Bonhoeffer in 1945 at the age of 39. And so, welcome to Election Day Sermon 2020. It's gonna be a ride. Let's start with scripture and a word of prayer. I'm gonna read from Jeremiah chapter six. Uh, normally I would read on Sunday mornings from the New King James, but I'm actually going to read from the NIV because the NIV translation captures a word that I think is important to the day's topic. It is the word crossroads. And so I'm going to read from Je Jeremiah 6, verses 16 to 19 from the NIV translation, and this is what it says. Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear, O nations, observe, O witnesses, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. Now, I don't say this to be dramatic. I say this to be emphatic because I truly believe that America is at a crossroads. We're standing at a crossroads. And I feel today somewhat like God has called me to sound a trumpet here. A trumpet that we could recognize the importance of standing at this crossroads and looking and asking for the ancient paths. What's that a reference to? It's a, it's a reference to the ancient truths of God that are timeless. And to look for the good way and to walk in it because he says, if we do that, we'll find rest for our souls. We can have rest for the soul of America. If Christians would rise to the occasion, ask what the good way is and walk in it, set the example, lead the way, intercede in prayer. Because if we don't, God says in the rest of the text that he brings disaster on those people. Now I know we're not responsible for the whole nation, we're just one congregation, but I hope and pray that collectively, collectively, if the body of Christ in our country can get their act together and really serve God, honor God, and do what is right to honor him in this election cycle, 
then perhaps once again, God will have mercy on our nation. That's my hope and that's my prayer. So, let me start with the word of prayer. Father God, we come before you. Our hearts are full. Uh, we, Lord, are just so aware of what's going on in our nation right now, and we just want to honor you in today's service. We want, Lord, you to speak to our hearts. Maybe there are some ways that we're not thinking in the right way, so adjust our thinking. Maybe we're not living in the right way. We pray you would convict us to live in the right way, that we would honor you and exemplify you, because we want you to be high and lifted up and exalted in our nation, because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And may the church wake up and rise to the occasion of honoring you and living for you and serving you and letting our voices be heard in this election cycle. Thank you for the privilege of living in the greatest and freest country on earth. May we be good stewards of what you've entrusted to us as the church of Jesus Christ. We love you and we praise you together in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Take a look at the screens. Were these men of God throughout history being too political? 1450 BC, Moses petitioned Pharaoh for the liberty of God's people, even calling down consequences when the king failed to comply. 870 BC, Elijah, in the name of the Lord, he challenged King Ahab and his advisors for their ungodly policies and practices. 29 AD, should John the Baptist have kept quiet rather than confronting King Herod about his immoral lifestyle, even though it cost him his ministry and even his life? 30 AD, when Pilate said to Jesus, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Was Jesus too political when he replied, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above? 31 AD, were Peter and John getting political when they publicly refused to comply with the governing authorities who told them not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus? 54 AD, the Apostle Paul preached the gospel in Ephesus in such a way that it totally disrupted both business and politics in the region. 1775, in early America, would you have joined Pastor Jonas Clark in Lexington, Massachusetts, when he led his church and community to form a militia and face the British in the War for Independence? 1830, be holy as God is holy. How political was Second Great Awakening preacher Charles Finney? when he passionately called for an end to slavery from the pulpit. 1954, was separation of church and state being honored when Dr. George McPherson Dougherty preached a sermon that convinced President Eisenhower to include under God in our Pledge of Allegiance? 1963, I have a dream. What about the civil disobedience of Baptist minister, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who led civil rights marches, giving his life for the cause? Were all of these men of God being too political, or were they just being biblical? Just being biblical. Now this is frankly the pushback that I get when I deliver these kind of election day sermons from some people who think that pastors should refrain from politics, don't turn the pulpit into anything political, and the whole idea is that you know we can somehow integrate our faith in all aspects of life except government and politics. Pastor, leave that one alone. We as Christians should not concern ourselves with politics. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Don't you think that Representative Ilhan Omar integrates her faith in politics? Don't you think that Rashida Tlaib integrates her faith in politics? You better believe it. In fact, for those of you who are not aware, Joe Biden has already publicly declared that he will be adding Muslims to his administration. Listen to him yourself. I will end the Muslim ban on day one. Day one. Hadith from the Prophet Muhammad instructs, whomever among you sees a wrong, let him change it with his hand. If he is not able, then with his tongue. If he is not able, and with his heart. Make no mistake, people. 2020 is our year. Let's dive into it with 2020 vision. We can see clearly that America is fighting for its very soul. We, we all come from the same root here in terms of our fundamental basic beliefs. And uh, I just want to thank you for uh, 
for giving me the opportunity, for being engaged, for committing uh, to action this November. It matters. Your voice, your voice is your vote. Your vote is your voice. Muslim American voices matter. I'll be a president who seeks out and listens to and incorporates the ideas and concerns of Muslim Americans on everyday issues that matter most to our communities. I will include having Muslim American voices as part of my administration. But getting out the vote, getting our families out the vote, getting our elderly out the vote, getting our masjids out the vote, getting our neighborhoods out the vote. So let's do our part and join the largest Muslim voter mobilization in America, the Million Muslim Votes Campaign. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's make our voices heard. Because we got the means, we got the numbers, and we got the power. <laughs> I share this with you not to disparage Muslim Americans. The fact of the matter is that we as Christians, if we want religious freedom, the First Amendment, then we want that for all faiths. That is America. Everybody should have the freedom to worship in the United States of America. Well, what I am saying is that if as Christians, somehow you believe the lie that faith and politics don't mix, that pastors should stay out of that, it's just too divisive, then by your apathy and your reluctance, you are actually helping to advance the doctrine and dogma of other world religions and of secular humanism to influence this nation rather than the values and virtues of Christianity. That's what's happening. Wake up. They're not asleep. They're not asleep. Why are Christians asleep today when it comes to this? Now the fact is that only in recent times have pastors kowtowed to political correctness and remained silent or indifferent about faith and politics, but it wasn't always so. A brief little history lesson. Dating back to the time of the American colonies and in subsequent years, pastors boldly spoke out about the social issues of the day and they called out the political candidates who were running for office. Every year, Pastors would deliver what they would call election sermons, the kind of thing I'm doing today, only I do it every four years. They used to do it every year. For the first couple hundred years of American history, pastors would preach election sermons. And I only get to bring these books out every four years when I do an election sermon, but I have two volumes here of political sermons of the American founding era from 1730 to 1805. These are published sermons of what pastors used to do, how they used to get up in their pulpits and talk to people in their congregation about the social issues and call out the politicians. Why? The reason is because they wanted their folks to be biblically literate so that people could make an intelligent decision based on their sanctified conscience about the social issues and the political candidates and how they either did or did not align with the Bible which is the source of all truth. The truth is that God has been at the center of our religious freedom and faith and politics have been intertwined from the very beginning, from the founding of our nation in 1776, not 1619. Wake up. But 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was penned, listen to the various references to God in the Declaration of Independence. It starts with, quote, the laws of nature and nature's God in the first paragraph. It establishes that our, quote, unalienable rights come not from government, but from, quote, our creator, that's paragraph two. It appeals to, quote, the supreme judge of the world, that's the last paragraph. And then it invokes the protection of, quote, divine providence in the signature line of all 56 signers when they pledged to each other their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And then Congress actually instructed churches to read the Declaration of Independence from their steps so that everybody could hear across America. Churches were demanded by Congress to do such a thing. In fact, the false church, the Episcopal church, the, the old false church in false church was one of those locations where in 1776 the Declaration of Independence was read from the steps of the church. That's how the news was dispersed in a day without social media. It was pastors who led the charge 
with the American Revolution to sever ties with Great Britain because of the oppression and tyranny of the government, in particular, oppression and tyranny of religious freedom. Pastors led that charge. Pastors like Jonas Clark, who formed the Minutemen Militia in Lexington with 70 men from his congregation who fought against and defeated 700 British who marched against them in the first war, the Battle of Lexington of the, Re in the first battle, the Battle of Lexington of the Revolutionary War, April the 19th, 1775. Then when the British were defeated in Lexington, they moved on to Concord, where they were met by William Emerson, the pastor of the church there, the grandfather of Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who summoned 300 of his men to fight against the British in Concord. Pastors like John Peter Mullenberg from Woodstock, Virginia, not too far from here, down 81, who on January the 21st, 1776, preached a message to his congregation from Ecclesiastes chapter three. The part about how there's a time for everything and a season for everything under the sun. When he got to verse eight in Ecclesiastes three, which talks about a time for peace and a time for war, John Peter Mullenberg said to his people, this is no longer a time for peace. This is a time for war. And he removed his black clerical robe to reveal the officer's uniform in the Continental Army. And he walked to the back of his church and he said to his men, how many men are with me? We're gonna fight. 300 of his men followed him out the door that day and it formed the 8th Virginia Brigade in the Revolutionary War in the Continental Army. These are pastors leading the charge. Before James Madison became president, when he was running for the first Congress in 1789, he was running for the first Congress from Virginia, the 5th Congressional District. He met with some Baptists in Richmond. The Virginia Baptists held a convention. They sat down with James Madison and they said, listen, Madison, you will not get our votes unless you change your Federalist views and you write a Bill of Rights, especially to include in the First Amendment religious freedom. James Madison took their advice. He wrote the Bill of Rights, including Amendment number one, religious freedom. And that same year, 1789, he was elected from Virginia to the first Congress of the United States. Don't mess with the Baptists. <laughs> Friends, pastors and Christians have long been involved in government and politics. In George Washington's farewell address in 1796, he said, quote, religion and morality are indispensable supports of our political prosperity. So what went wrong? Why are so many pulpits and pews silent today? Quite honestly, I think because pastors have shirked their responsibilities and it has led to an anemic church in America. Well, what about the separation of church and state, Pastor G? Well, I'm glad you asked. The phrase, the separation of church and state, appears nowhere in our founding documents, not in the Declaration of Independence, nowhere in the Constitution, not in the Bill of Rights either, nowhere. So where did it come from? In 1802, when Thomas Jefferson was president, he wrote a letter, a personal letter, to the Danbury Baptist Association in Danbury, Connecticut in response to a letter that they had sent him requesting clarification about the First Amendment. So Jefferson in 1802 wrote a letter to the Danbury Baptists and said to them, don't worry, the First Amendment is in place in order to protect you from any government intrusion or overreach. And in that letter, Jefferson wrote, quote the phrase, building a wall of the separation of church and state. About 150 years later, after Jefferson had penned that amongst the volume of his personal letters, about 150 years later, it was used, in fact twisted, to remove God from the public square and to remove the church from any government influence. When the fact of the matter is that the First Amendment was written not to keep the church out of government, but to keep the government out of the church. Wake up. Understand what is happening in our nation. Now, 
2020 has been a difficult year, no doubt about it. A global pandemic, race relations, riots, defunding the police, Black Lives Matter, the cancel culture, the woke culture, whatever that is, a contentious presidential race, a Supreme Court fight. I mean, is anybody tired yet? I've never wanted to watch the ball drop in Times Square more than I want to watch it drop this year. But the truth of the matter is that turning a page in the calendar will not turn the hearts of people. Only Jesus can do that. So as Christians, we have to see everything in our world through the lens of Jesus and the Bible, everything. We have to see everything in our world through the lens of Jesus and the Bible in regards to both identifying the problems in our culture and, number two, offering the solution to those problems. So enough of the history lesson, here's a little Bible lesson. One of the earthly institutions that God ordained and put in place to help mitigate human behavior and human life is government. That's Romans chapter 13. And God tells us in Romans chapter 13 through the pen of Paul that the purpose of government is to basically cultivate the good and punish the evil. And that God ordains a ruler or a leader, whomever that person might be, be it a king or be it a prime minister or be it a president, to be instruments of his righteousness. I'll put Romans 13 verse 4 up on the screen. The ruler is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. Again, in other words, God's intent for government is twofold, to help cultivate the good and to punish the evil of a society. Government is not the savior, Jesus is, but government can cultivate the good and punish the evil to help maintain a prosperous and orderly society. And thus, when we have opportunity in, in our land to be a part of this process, to vote in the free country in which we live, then we as Christians must choose leaders, we must choose men and women who best represent a biblical worldview in terms of policies and procedures that will cultivate the good and punish the evil. It is our responsibility and a privilege that we've been given. That when we are voting, we're voting for policies and procedures that will then give a mandate to government in terms of how they are to conduct themselves and the rulers regarding policies and procedures to cultivate the good and to punish the evil in our land. Listen, this is about policies and procedures. This is not about personality. Presidential race is not a personality contest. Get over it. It is not about personalities. I gotta be honest with you. If it were just about personalities, I'd vote for Joe Biden. I mean, he looks like a fun grandpa. I'm not kidding you, he looks like a fun grandpa who would, who would charter a boat and take you fishing. Whereas Trump actually owns the boat and makes fun of you if you don't catch anything that day. See, if it were solely based on personality, okay, but it's not. And this is what everybody needs to hear. Now, it would be wonderful if you had both righteous policies and procedures and a righteous personality. If you had both of those, wouldn't that be wonderful? That's called the millennial kingdom and Jesus. Wait for it. It's coming. That's what it's called. But in the meantime, in the meantime, when there is a choice between policies and procedures and personalities, I'm going to choose policies and procedures every single time. Every single time. Because that is what will affect the daily life in a society. A nation will rise and fall on the policies of a king, not the personalities of a king. So look around you at the culture. 
Look around at the issues of our day and ask yourself which policies and procedures as put forth by the two main parties in America will accomplish God's purposes of government cultivating the good and punishing the evil. We have to look at all these different issues that we're surrounded by, and there's a lot. We have to ask ourselves, if there is no perfect kingdom until the millennial kingdom and Jesus is reigning, then how can we do our best to look at policies and procedures separated from personality contests and recognize what policies and procedures best come closest to most represent our convictions with a biblical worldview in order for government to advance the good and to punish the evil? For example, shortly after the death of George Floyd, Terry and I invited two black couples from our church to our home to sit down, have some coffee and dialogue and share together. I mean, listen, let's just be real. When we talk about raw subjects like this, I, I recognize that as a, as a white man, I may not fully understand the perspective of my black brothers and sisters. And unless you walk in my shoes, you don't necessarily know my life. Unless I don't walk in your shoes, I don't necessarily know your life. So it was a wonderful time. We, we sat down, the three of uh, our, uh, us, couples, spent about four hours together. And at the end of it, they all said to me, Pastor Gary, just keep teaching the word. Amen. They said, just, just keep teaching the word because the word of God addresses all sin issues, including racism. So if you just keep teaching the word, that's going to do, God's going to do his work to change hearts and lives of people. Amen. And then I asked them, because it was just, you know, they were wonderful. They were very receptive. I said, okay, let's just get all stuff out on the table. I said, what's your opinion about Black Lives Matter? Okay. All of them disavowed Black Lives Matter as an organization. Amen. I'll tell you why in a minute. And as far as the motto goes, one of the ladies spoke up and she said, well, of course, as a black woman, do, do I need to know and do we all need to affirm that Black Lives Matter, of course. She said, but as a Christian, I also have to look at the world through the lens of the Bible. And when I look at the world through the lens of the Bible, I have to say that all lives matter, period. All lives matter. And she said, but I gotta be honest, I get pushback from my own family because I say all lives matter. And by the way, while we're on the subject, if black lives really mattered as an organization, they should be picketing every Planned Parenthood clinic in America. True. Because, because Planned Parenthood was founded by an avowed racist, Margaret Sanger, who in a letter to Clarence Gamble on December the 10th, 1939, wrote this, quote, we do not want word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, end quote. Amen, Amen sister. <laughs> now listen, listen on this. So here's where you start to engage biblical worldview, evaluating political parties a little, and political platforms. What political party is all about the funding of Planned Parenthood? What political party is all about abortion on demand, which has exterminated 18 million precious black babies alone in the United States of America? Think about it, wake up. What is happening in our nation? What political party is embracing Black Lives Matter as an organization that was founded on admitted Marxist ideology? and until recently had posted on their website, front page, their statement of beliefs. Now they've since taken it down, but before they did, I copied a lot of stuff down. <laughs> they call for the dissolution of the nuclear family and for the advancement of transgender rights. They said on their website, quote, we foster a queer affirming network, end quote. Do you know that most black Americans are socially conservative, even if they're Democrats? So in other words, the ideology of the Black Lives Movement organization does not even 
represent the very people they purport to care about. It's hypocrisy. It's absolute hypocrisy. Back in August, I, I mentioned this in August, and some of you were like, hey, that's really good, and others of you were like, why did you do that? But back in August, I was invited by the president to go to the White House to hear his acceptance speech for his, for his nomination for his second term, and I went, and um, it's okay, you don't need to applaud. But uh, when I was there, um, I was seated with some evangelicals, many of whom I had you know, watched from afar on TV, and, and so I got to socialize a little bit and, and meet some of them, like Dr. Jack Graham and Greg Laurie, Skip Heitzig, um, Jensen Franklin was there, John Hagee was there. Uh, sitting directly in front of me was Franklin Graham, and so I talked to him a little bit because I'm, I'm really good friends with his uh, nephew, Stefan, who's been here many times, and so we chatted up about Stefan. Stefan, I'll get to you later about all that. But, um, and then directly behind me was a gentleman I'd never met before. He was a bishop with the Church of God. His name was Kelvin Kubaris. And um, we struck up a conversation and, and a friendship and I want you to hear a little bit of his story. So I sat down and recorded an interview with him. It's a, a lengthier interview we'll have posted on our social media today, but I just took a, a little six minute segment of it that I wanna share with you uh, this afternoon. So take a look at your screens. This is Bishop Kelvin Kobaris. Explain to me, you were telling me on the South Lawn of the White House how you had been a lifelong Democrat. Um, you had the opportunity uh, and still have the opportunity to interface with the president. Tell us how you made a shift in your in your heart politically over over all these things. I was on my way to the White House. I'm sitting before the evangelicals, uh, uh, every name you can think of that was a part of the council at that time. And uh, when I came in the room, I addressed some of the things that I was concerned with. And then President Trump, being who he was, called over, not on the schedule, saying, who's over there? And they told him who was there. He said, bring them all to the Oval Office. I said, uh-oh, mm -hmm. uh, because this, the flooding was going on in Texas. He, I want them all to come over. Let's pray for the nation mm -hmm. because people are hurting in Texas. And I sat there for a moment and said, no, I'm not going over there. Not that I was afraid of President Trump. I was afraid of the backlash that was going to come from my community because yeah. it was one thing for me to go to the White House and have a private meeting. But I know that the moment I walked into the Oval Office, every media outlet right. was going to be there and every African-American in the world that knows me uh, uh, was going to see me. And before I left the White House, I, my phone was going to be blowing up. Yep. And that's exactly what occurred. I bet. However, when I was sitting there paralyzed by, about not going, I heard the voice of the Lord mm. come to me and say that I have opened this door for you as my prophet. Mm. And the prophet's responsibility is to speak truth to power. Mm. And how can you speak truth to power except you have access? He said, the door is open. He said, do you want to be a friend of theirs or a friend of mine? Mm. And when he said there, he's speaking of my community. He's speaking of those who look like me who were going to give me backlash. Yep. He said, or do you want to be my friend? I said, well, Lord, at the end of the day, <laughs> I want to be your friend. Amen. So do what I say. So I got up. I walked in over office. We were able to share our hearts with President Trump. He listened to us. He received what we had to say. We prayed for the nations. We laid hand on him. We prayed for him. And from that day, that's when the door opened for me to be a part of the faith and opportunity initiative that gave me access to the president quite often in meetings every other month, giving him counsel and guidance and prayer on many of the uh, issues and policies that he's written. And even when there's different national crises and things that are going on, I was there to provide, provide perspective from people who look like me from my community. Now, please note that uh, taking on that position opened up a lot of scrutiny and a lot of challenges because my community had an issue with me meeting with him. They didn't have an issue with me meeting with President Obama. They didn't have an issue with me meeting with President Clinton but they had an issue with me meeting with President Trump. What what kind of pushback did you get? Oh, I got a, a, a attacks on social media. Uh, oh, I was called Uncle Tom. I was called Coon. Mm. I was called Traitor. I had family members send me notes. I had colleagues tell me I needed to resign from being the president of our ministerial alliance because I have misrepresented the black community for mm. being aligned with Donald Trump. The list went on and on and on. And so there were some colleagues of mine that I thought were friends that God identified that they were not. 
There were some people who were very close to me that I thought were friends and that situation identified that they were not. And as a matter of fact, I lost groves of members, rows of members walked out of my church that I was pastoring at that time because they felt that I was aligned with the wrong person and the wrong individual. Like I got to tell people, don't hate the mailman. If you don't like the mail that I'm delivering, you speak to the one who sent the message. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, we've all seen the quote when Joe Biden was being interviewed and he said, uh, if you have to figure out who to vote for, you ain't black. Remember when he... When he said yes. that, why, why, why in general does the black community feel like they have to toe the Democratic Party line? Why? It is my uh, contention that the reason why our community toes that line is because it's been generationally uh, passed down, right. in a sense, to, <laughs> to put it that way. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you're born into a family that's a family of Democrats, that influence from your parents uh, spills over on you. And a lot of times we don't really look into platforms. We don't look into the views of that particular party. We just we just take on that party affiliation because that's what our family has always been. In the most cases, generally when I speak to people and I ask them what is the Democratic platform, they can't express three point, points of view about it. Yeah. They're just a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, our community maligns <laughs> anybody else who thinks outside of that box, mm -hmm. who who separates themselves from that way of thinking and that following. And then we get labeled as Coons and Uncle Toms and whitewashed because they have labeled the Republican Party as a white party, uh, the good old party for the good old boys. Mm -hmm. So that means that if any black person aligns themselves with it, you must be that coon who's selling out your community when that's not the case at all. And I asserted myself, went down, changed my party affiliation to Republican. And the reason why is, and I'll tell anybody, is because it had nothing to do with President Donald Trump. It had nothing to do with any of that. It had more to do with where the policies align, where the party was standing. And that, that does not mean that the Republican Party is biblically right on anything because they are far from biblically right on everything right. because there's some things that contradict what we believe as Christians in the Republican Party. However, they're more in line with my moral and spiritual values than that of the liberal uh, agenda. So that's where I decided to align and that's where I am. And, and to this point, that's where I'm going to stay. So, don't look at the clock because I got just a little bit longer, but you heard what he said there. A lot of people don't know what the platforms are. What do these parties believe? What are the candidates what are they standing on in terms of the platform? So we're gonna have a little guessing game today called Guess the Party Platform. <laughs> and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you just five out of many issues we could talk about. By the way, they're all in this little uh, brochure that we have available if there's some left after the first service called the uh, Vote Your Values Voter Prayer Guide. It's a great uh, publication. It was put out by Intercessors for America, uh, Dave Cabal and, and his wife, Chris Go here to Cornerstone. The ministry is located in, in Percival. And so you can pick one of the, one per family or whatever's left out there at the um, different exits at the east or west kiosks. But I'm going to share real quickly five platforms, and I'm not going to tell you the party affiliation. I want you to tell me what aligns most with your biblical worldview. Here we go. The first one is going to be on religious freedom. This party said, we value the right of America's religious leaders to preach and Americans to speak freely according to their faith. We believe the federal government, specifically the IRS, is constitutionally prohibited from policing or censoring speech based on religious convictions or beliefs. We pledge to defend the religious beliefs and rights of conscience of all Americans and to safeguard religious institutions against government control. The next party said this on the same subject. Quote, we celebrate America's history of religious pluralism and tolerance and recognize the countless acts of service of our faith communities as well as the paramount importance of maintaining the separation of church and state enshrined in our Constitution. Which party platform, number one and number two, more, most closely resembles a biblical worldview? Number one. The second one is the Democratic platform. I don't think they heard my sermon today. It's nowhere in the Constitution. It's not enshrined. On the subject of marriage and sexuality, these are in no particular order. 
This party said, quote, we will fight to enact the Equality Act. We will work to ensure LGBTQ people are not discriminated against when seeking to adopt or foster children, protect LGBTQ plus children from bullying and assault, and guarantee transgender students access to facilities based on their gender identity. We will ensure that all transgender and non-binary people can procure official government identification documents that accurately reflect their gender identity. On this same issue, the other party said this, quote, foremost among those institutions is the American family. It is the foundation of civil society, and the cornerstone of the family is natural marriage, the union of one man and one woman. We oppose the imposition of a social cultural revolution upon the American people by wrongly redefining sex discrimination, reshaping our entire society to fit the mold of an ideology alien to America's history and traditions. Is the first slide or the second slide more conducive to your biblical worldview? The second one. This is the Republican Party. Listen, um, the vice presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket, Kamala Harris, boasted that as Attorney General of California, she was the first one to perform same-sex marriage in California. This is her ideology, you understand. This is what would come into the White House. Joe Biden on a town hall forum just the other night, you might have seen it on TV, when asked by a mom who had young children, he said to her, I believe it's perfectly acceptable for eight to 10-year-old children to define their own sexuality. Have we lost our minds? Facebook used to post 70 options until they took it off because they realized maybe that's a little excessive. A little bit. But this is what is happening. How about uh, the whole agenda of Drag Queen Story Hour? Have you been reading up on this? It's hitting the public schools where drag queens are invited in to read storybooks to elementary age children. What is happening here? The agenda that is pushing that is a liberal progressive, I'll say demonically inspired agenda to advance that kind of a thing. On the issue of the economy, one party said, quote, government cannot create prosperity, though government can limit or destroy it. Prosperity is the product of self-discipline, enterprise, saving, and investment by individuals, but is not an end in itself. The other party said, we will forge a new social and economic contract with the American people, a contract that creates millions of new jobs and promotes shared prosperity. Which one more closely aligns, slide one or this slide? Slide one. Slide one. You know what the buzzwords are here? Shared prosperity, that's political speak. It's socialism. It's the redistribution of wealth. And let me just quickly add here. You know, for those of you millennials or new uh, 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 Gen Xers or Gen Zers who are really enthralled with the idea of everything is free, free tuition, free, free healthcare, everything's free. Let me tell you something, wait. Wait a minute, I got a C in economics in college. I had a great economics professor though, Dr. Walter Williams, the first conservative black man I ever met in my life. But I learned this much. If you think everything is free, you're mistaken, because somebody's paying for that, and guess who? It's you. So what happens is, when the government gives you free stuff, they have to jack up taxes to pay for your free stuff. When they jack up your taxes, you can't afford anything anymore, so now you're more dependent on the government, and thus the cycle continues. The Bible doesn't teach socialism. You know what the Bible teaches? The Bible teaches that hard work will be rewarded, and the Bible teaches that we should also be mindful of the poor among us, because that also will be rewarded if you're kind to the poor, but not redistribute the wealth. That's unbiblical. In Proverbs 13, verse 4, it says, but those who work hard will prosper. In Proverbs 29, uh, 22, verse 9, it says, he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. That's the combination that works in America and around the world. That's God's design. It's not redistrib redistributing the wealth. It's hard work and being mindful of the poor and helping them as well. I don't know if, if you might have caught this, if any of you follow on our social media, but among the comments as people were writing, I took note of one man's comment on on our social media in anticipation of today's uh, teaching with a warning. And he said this, he said, I come from a country, and he named it Venezuela. I come from a country, Venezuela, where the church did not get involved in politics and the result was evil took power. If the church does not speak the truth, nobody will. Wake up, beloved America. 
It's true. It's true. Because socialism and government overreach is what has ruined Venezuela. We gotta make sure that doesn't happen in America. Real quickly, a couple more topics. I'll be honest, the topic of Israel, it's precious to us as evangelical Christians, not too terribly different, and I'll just tell you right up front, this is the democratic platform. We recognize the worth of every Israeli and every Palestinian. That's why we will work to help bring to an end a conflict that has brought so much pain to so many. We support a negotiated two-state solution that ensures Israel's future as a Jewish and democratic state with recognized borders and upholds the right of Palestinians to live in freedom and security in a viable state of their own. The Republicans said, beyond our mutual strategic interest, Israel is likewise an exceptional country that shares our most essential values. It is the only country in the Middle East where freedom of speech and freedom of religion are found. Therefore, support for Israel is an expression of Americanism, and it is the responsibility of our government to advance policies that reflect Americans' strong desire for a relationship with no daylight between America and Israel. Our party is proud to stand with Israel now and always. I'll tell you the basic difference here is that Democrats believe in a two-state solution. Um, and, and Republicans basically believe, give Israel the land that they deserve and the borders they are entitled to, seeing as how God already established their borders to be much larger than they presently are, and with the hopes and desire that the Palestinians will be able to leave, live peacefully within the nation of Israel, as they once did prior to 1947. The problem is, until Hezbollah and Hamas stops firing rockets into Israel, that's not gonna happen. And unfortunately, though, you're seeing little by little peace agreements happening under this president, a new peace deal between Israel and United Arab Emirates and Israel and Bahrain. And this president, in regards to Israel, was the only one who not only said it, because the past four presidents have said it too, but he was the only one who actually did move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Israeli Ambassador Ron Dermer stood right here in this pulpit uh, last year and said that this president is the most pro-Israeli president that we've ever had. On the last subject is the subject of life. This party said the Constitution's guarantee that no one can be deprived of life, liberty, or property deliberately echoes the Declaration of Independence's proclamation that all are endowed by their creator with the inalienable right to life. Accordingly, we assert the sanctity of human life and affirm that the unborn child has a fundamental right to life which cannot be infringed. We support a human life amendment to the Constitution and legislation to make clear that the 14th Amendment's protections apply to children before birth. The other party said, quote, we will appoint U.S. Supreme Court justices and federal judges who will respect and enforce foundational precedents, including Roe v. Wade. We believe every woman should be able to access high-quality reproductive health care services, including safe and legal abortion. We oppose and will fight to overturn federal and state laws that create barriers to women's reproductive health and rights. Slide one or slide two? Slide one was the Republican platform. This is a no-brainer here. This is an absolute no-brainer. Trump is the most pro-life president that America's ever had. His policies prove it. His policies prove it. He is the only president that has ever t attended one of the marches for life in Washington, D.C. The only one. And I don't know if you caught this, but just recently he gave thanks to God for his recovery of COVID. Did you see this? It's just a one minute little clip. I'll play it for you. Masks, no masks, everything. You can do all you want, but you know, you still need help from the boss. We need help from the boss. That's what happened. We need help. Right. Yeah, we need help. It's all right to say it. Somebody said to me the other day, you're the most famous person in the world by far. I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. They said, yes, you are. I said, no. They said, who's more famous? I said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm not taking any chances. I'm not going to have an argument. Hey, I'm not having any arguments. Jesus Christ. I'm not going to take any chances. I'll give it, I guarantee. 
And let me look up and I'll say, and it's not even close. <laughs> You've, you've been gracious uh, to me. I know I've gone over time. I want to close uh, with a few closing comments. A few years ago, I got a, a letter from uh, a sweet old lady who attended our church. I know old is relative, but she was actually over 100. <laughs> she sent me a letter, and it was a gentle rebuke. It was handwritten, you know, kind of trembling hands. I mean, understandably, if you're 100, right? Um, and in her letter, her gentle rebuke was because she could hear my, my political slant in teaching through the Bible because, to be quite honest, the Bible shapes that political slant for me. But she was a lifelong Democrat. And so in her letter, she talked to me about how, you know, it didn't seem fair. And, and she mentioned to me that the first president she had voted for was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. She died a couple of years ago at like 101, 102, I don't remember, but sweet lady. The fact of the matter, friends, is that the Democratic Party is no longer the party of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It's not even the party of JFK. To be quite honest with you, it's not even the party of Bill Clinton. I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> it's true. It's true, under the Clinton administration, Congress passed the Defense of Marriage Act. Clinton signed it into law that defined marriage for federal purposes as between one man and one woman. And in 2013, the US Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional. But Clinton signed that law. Now things have changed. The Democratic Party is now a progressive party of AOC and Rashida Tlaib and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Why do I say this? Because listen to me, I'm gonna speak truth to you. If you are a lifelong Democrat, your party has left you. Your party has left you. That ship has sailed, it's true. I used to believe I used to believe that the two-party system in America was much like a husband and a wife in a marriage. Just differences. Just, you know, different people with different approaches and different perspectives, but who shared a common goal and vision in life. And so therefore, you could learn from each other's different perspective and, and you would balance each other out. I don't believe that anymore. I believe that there is a liberal progressive agenda influenced by spiritual forces of evil that if allowed to progress will be the demise of America. I believe it with all my heart. And while people are sitting around foolishly talking about how they don't like Trump's tweets and his unfiltered style and his checkered past, meanwhile, the enemy is roaming around like a roaring lion looking for a nation to devour. I know, Clinton, uh, uh, Clinton, Trump is not gonna win Miss Congeniality. Get over it. It's not about personality. It's about guardians of what is true and what is right in our day. That's what we need to be concerned about. <laughs> Donald Trump is not our savior. Joe Biden is not our savior. Jesus Christ is our savior. And because... <laughs> And because he is my savior, as for me and my house, I cannot, I will not vote for a candidate whose party platform advocates the murder of unborn babies, embraces same-sex marriage, encourages transgender behavior, and ignores God and his word in our culture. I cannot, I will not. Cannot. Cannot, will not. Will not. Amen. Amen. L listen, if you in good conscience 
cannot vote for Donald Trump, then don't. But I don't know how, in good conscience, a Christian can vote for an agenda that is evil. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproof to any people, Proverbs 14, 34. I close with this story. Dr. Erwin Lutzer, the pastor of Moody Bible, Moody Bible Church in Chicago, wrote a book several years ago entitled, When a Nation Forgets God, Seven Lessons We Must Learn from Nazi Germany. It's a good read. He quotes in that book a German eyewitness who reflected on the apathy and indifference of the church during World War II. And in the book, Lutzer quotes from this German eyewitness, and this is what that individual said, quote, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because what could anyone do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized that it was carrying Jews like cattle in the cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we could hear the cries of the Jews en route to a death camp. Their screams tormented us. We knew the time the train was coming, and when we heard the whistle blow, we began singing hymns. By the time the train came past our church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sang more loudly, and soon we heard them no more. Years have passed, and no one talks about it anymore. But I still hear that train whistle in my sleep. God, forgive me. Forgive all of us who called ourselves Christians and yet did nothing to intervene, end quote. Friends, l listen, we cannot as a church, as a people of God, ignore or remain silent about the moral issues of our day. To do so is not only cowardly, it is complicit in the evil. Do not sing more loudly Instead, stand up for what is right. Declare the truth. Live your lives in such a way that God is glorified. Trust him. Look to him only as the supreme judge who sits on the throne. And may God be exalted and may his enemies be defeated in our nation for his glory. Father, this is our prayer that you would stir our hearts, that we cannot and must not remain silent, but that in our day, we must be a voice for righteousness. I pray, God, that you would stir us to do what is right and honorable, to disavow any association with principles or procedures that are offensive to you, and that we would do what is necessary so that you would be exalted in our land. We know that human vessels are frail. There is no perfect president. We look forward to the day, Jesus, when you come and you rule and reign. But until that day, may we be used by you to do our best to promote righteousness in your land. Because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Be glorified, Lord, in our nation and have mercy on us. In your name. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing God Bless America.